The SWIG program in dual studies and social justice of the University of San Francisco acknowledges our presence on the unceded land of the indigenous Ohlone communities and pays our respects to these traditional caretakers and elders past, present, and emerging. It is our intention that this acknowledgement plays a role, however infinitesimal, in a much larger process of confronting the past in order to create a not yet realized future rooted in justice. Welcome everyone to the USF SWIG program in Jewish studies and social justice is second event of the fall 2022 semester. Cheers. My name is Aaron Han Tapper. It's my honor and privilege to direct this program. Before introducing tonight's keynote speaker, let me tell you a little bit about USF and our extraordinary Jewish studies and social justice program. Founded in 1855, USF is the city's is the city of San Francisco's first university, a premier Jesuit Catholic school. In 1977, we became the first Catholic institution in the world to establish a Jewish studies program. Some 30 years later, in 2008, we became the first university of any kind, Catholic and otherwise, to have an academic program formally linking Jewish studies and social justice. And then in 2019, we added yet another first to our renowned history by forming a new position on campus, that of rabbi in residence. With the hiring of Rabbi Camille Shira Angel, we became the first Catholic school with a queer rabbi in residence in the history of the planet Earth. Through the SWIG JSSJ program, we believe that education is the best long-term way to create systemic change. Whether one has the time to take a semester long course or a mere few hours to hear from a single speaker, Education is fundamental to making our world better, paramount in shining the spotlight on the margins, on oppressed communities who are mistreated merely because of their race, ethnicity, religion, gender, sexual orientation, or another social identity together, altogether. Let me briefly let you know about a few other Jewish studies and social justice program events we're putting on this semester. As you may know, this week we're celebrating the Jewish holiday of Sukkot, hence why you're in this interesting hut type edifice. During this time, Jews traditionally build temporary dwellings. One of the intentions is to help remind us of the transient nature of life. Many of these dwellings, including ours, are built structurally to embody openness, both literally and spiritually. We have three other events planned this week, all taking place in this sukkah. Tomorrow evening from 4.30 to 6, we're hosting author, artist, and genius wordsmith, Eli Raymer, where he will share with us his most recent book, Texting with Angels. Then on Thursday, October 13th from 6.30 to 8, we will host Tatiana Lubovitsky Acosta, a self-identified Jewish, queer, Nicaraguanese, anarchist, artist, poet, and sexual health educator, who's also the author of two collections of poetry. And then finally, on Friday, October 14th, from 5 to 7, we will have a Friday night or Jewish Sabbath dinner with speakers, food, music, and community, an event we're putting on in partnership with Value Culture. All of these events are open to anyone, although the Friday one's really for students. Our final event of the semester will be held on Wednesday, November 16th from 6.30 to 8 in From Hall, where we will host scholar Mira Amiras, the creator of Malka's Notebook, a graphic novel about and love letter to the Hebrew alphabet. If you want to learn more about these events or sign up for our once a month newsletter, there's a shine up sheet on the table right outside. Now, without further ado, let me pivot towards tonight's event. In one of his talks, renowned attorney and activist Brian Stevenson says the following. In the United States, we don't talk about slavery. We don't talk about the native genocide. We don't talk about lynching. We don't talk about segregation. You start talking about race and people get nervous. You start talking about racial justice and people are looking for exits. Our landscape is littered with iconography designed to romanticize the period of enslavement to celebrate and honor the architects and defenders of native genocide. We talk about transitional justice in other parts of the world. The State Department is even funded to assist such efforts in Europe, Asia, and Africa, but we don't do this in this country. The time is now. 
I think we have too many people in this country, he says, who want to talk about truth and repair or truth and reconciliation and truth and justice, but they want to skip the truth part and jump right to this reparation or reconciliation part. I don't think it works that way. It's the truth part, he says, that's actually the hard part. When we all have a consciousness of the truth, the repair part actually becomes much easier. To extend Stevenson's words at USF, we talk a great deal about social change. Change the world from here. Countless members of our community engage in social justice. We talk the talk and we walk the walk, and I believe this, but we still fall entirely short. Most relevant today, to today's event, we need to center indigenous people much more than we do. A land acknowledgement is a first step. Bringing someone to campus to speak about indigenous people on indigenous people's day is also a good step, but we have a long journey to go. As for another community I'm part of, the Jewish community, mainstream Jewish institutions have yet to integrate indigeneity into their consciousness. And yet in recent years, some individuals have begun this process. The East Bay Jewish group, Jews on Ohlone Land, and efforts by those such as Oakland activist and artist, Ariel Lucky, who we've been fortunate enough to bring to campus a few times. Those are excellent beginnings. Likewise in scholarship, there are a few isolated Jewish individuals who have begun efforts to learn more about indigenous groups and Jews connections to and with them, which leads me to tonight's speaker. Immediately after our keynote speaker's remark, he will be joined in a conversational Q&A led by social justice scholar activist, Professor Kusla Keslamata of USF. Professor Keslamata is an associate professor in the USF Department of Politics, a scholar of American Indian studies, and is Yak Titu Titu Northern Shumash and Yokut. Professor Keslamata first arrived at USF in 2007 as an ethnic minority dissertation fellow after completing a fellowship at the National Congress of American Indians the previous year. She received her PhD in political science at the University of Chicago. Prior to graduate school, she was a fellow in the Coral Fellows Program in Public Affairs in San Francisco and received her BA with honors from San Francisco State University. Among other things, she is the author of American Indians and the Trouble with Sovereignty a turn towards structural self-determination. For me personally, personally, Kusla has been and continues to be an ally. She's a constant colleague and supporter for which I am grateful. We look forward to hearing from Kusla in conversation shortly after Dr. Coffin's remark. After tonight's, as for tonight's keynote speaker, David Kaufman, he is the J. Richard Schiff Chair for the Study of Canadian Jewry and an associate professor in the Department of History at York University in Toronto. He is the author of The Jews Indian, Colonialism, Pluralism, and Belonging in America, which was a winner of an Association for Jewish Studies Jordan Schnitzer Book Award. He's also the editor of and contributor to No Better Home, Jews, Canada, and the Sense of Belonging. He serves as the editor-in-chief of the journal Canadian Jewish Studies, as the acting director of the Israel and Golda, Golda Koshitsky Center for Jewish Studies. He's published in such journals as the Journal of the Gilded Age and Progressive Era, the Journal of Jewish Education, Canadian Jewish Studies, American Jewish History, Contemporary Jewry, and the Journal of American Ethnic History, to name but a few. He also serves on the editorial boards of numerous important associations, including the Journal of Canadian Race Relations Foundation and AJS Review. Tonight, Dr. Kaufman will discuss his award-winning book with us. Please join me in welcoming him to USF. Thank you all. Thank you, Aaron, for that uh, lovely introduction, uh, and to um, uh, Rabbi Angel, uh, and to uh, Victoria for helping out with today's program, and to you in advance, uh, Professor Kestermata, for kicking us off in the Q&A, and just for engaging with my, my work. And of course, thanks to all of you for, for coming, having me at your guest here on at the university and on Ohlone land here today. 
I'm coming from uh, Toronto, Ontario, uh, and I'm going to give a land acknowledgement from where I'm from too. It's, Toronto is on the uh, traditional territory uh, of the Huron Wendat and the Mississaugas of the New Credit First Nation, um, among many others. Territory that remains what's called uh, remains subject. Should I put this on? Yeah, it's on. It's I just on. To be closer it's to you. Closer. Okay. Or it was on, but I, I might good. bring it back. This is territory that's on um, what's called the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, which was an agreement between um, uh, the Haudenosaunee people, who are called Iroquois sometimes, um, uh, and a consortium of Anishinaabeg or Ojibwe people, uh, and a bunch of allied nations to share and care for the lands around uh, the Great Lakes. Um, during this period of uh, Jewish calendrical time that we're in, uh, during Sukkot, our tradition points us to the themes of land and vulnerability and caretaking. Our time in the Sukkah is meant to help us relive uh, the Jewish ancestral generation-long wandering sojourn in the desert uh, with our bodies, the rituals, uh, and in an effort to make Torah or wisdom um, from the weaving together of this ancient tradition with our present day experiences afresh every year. Uh, the desert was a place of vulnerability and learning and of revelation and rebellion. And it was a place between the narrow place of slavery in Egypt, um, where food from the floodplains was a plenty, and the promised land of bounty and divine service, the land flowing with milk and honey. And in between was danger. So the sukkah is meant to have us recapitulate the experience of sort of barrenness, of barren land, and of being reliant on a God who had a vision for a people to be redeemed and devoted to goodness and a willingness to see ourselves through to the other side of our commitments. So it's particularly cool for me to offer these words tonight um, for, the, for all of you and the SWIG program for Jewish Studies and Social Justice. Uh, on Indigenous Peoples Day, on National Indigenous Peoples Day here in the United States and in a sukkah. Um, I prepared a talk that's about 45 minutes uh, and then should be lots of time for, for Q&A, which I hope will be you know, really open-ended and, uh, and, and honest. So bring your questions, bring your thoughts. So I've, I've spent about a decade now uh, reading about the places where Jewish and Indigenous histories intersect. And I believe that these intersections give rise to some broader conclusions about Jewish modernity as a whole. And I'll come back to these suggestions at the end of my talk, but I'd like to first begin with a little bit of a poke around uh, for the start of the story, question about where it actually begins. Uh, perhaps the Jewish Native American encounter began as soon as Jews first arrive in the so-called New World. It's true that Jews were drawn to Turtle Island by the Atlantic colonial triangular trade route and that successes here led them to settle permanently, they rode not just on the financing and supply network of their ethnic and filial connections around the port towns uh, where their brethren and co-religionists lived and with whom they could secure credit, um, as it's often discussed, but perhaps more fundamentally it, on the reliability uh, um, of a global market for goods. Jewish merchants entered into this historical drama of the Atlantic Triangle as part of a diasporic minority community, helping to circulate fur, uh, gold, guns, steam, um, seeds, tools, uh, and of course, enslaved human beings between Europe, its colonies, and Africa. Uh, Jews mostly focused on the fur. It was through indigenous fur, indigenous access to fur in the mainland, that, um, that Jews kind of gained their first foothold for permanent settlement at all on this continent. And these Jewish merchants became intimately involved in the economic development, the cultural transformations, and the political fallout in and between a host of different nations that this lucrative business inevitably entailed. Their interactions with Native Americans were a pretty complex blend of financial and social and religious and even sexual relations about which we know very little. Then again, maybe the encounter with Native America might have actually begun before Jews' first arrival here. 
with the spurious claim that the Indians of North and some of South America were, or a portion of them, were descendants of the lost tribes of Israel or had some other cultural connections to biblical history. Now, the claim preceded the first immigrants by many decades and was wildly popular, uh, hotly debated, and promoted and discredited repeatedly for an incredible range of differing ends by colonial administrators, by scholars, by missionaries, eventually by Mormons, uh, and indeed by many Jews for nearly 300 years, that this was a popular idea. The topic is partly covered in a new book by Matthew Doherty, highly recommended. It's called Lost Tribes Found, Israelite Indians and Religious Nationalism in Old America. Or perhaps the relationship between Jews and, his, and indigenous people began even earlier in the methods and minds of the Spanish civil and religious administrators who, according to anthropologist and cultural theorist Jonathan Boyarin, took what they had learned about managing Jewish difference in the Iberian Peninsula before and during and immediately after the Inquisition and applied it to the indigenous inhabitants that they would soon encounter as missionaries and colonizers uh, close to this part of the world. The colonized of Europe, perhaps, forged the model into which administrators tried to squeeze Native American, according to Boyarin's book, The Unconverted Self. But the story that I'd like to focus on tonight begins with, the, with Jewish immigrants to the United States and to the United States West that began in the middle of the 1800s, first from German-speaking provinces and later from Poland and Romania and the Russian Pale of Settlement, that you know, other colonial empire that has been uh, re-rearing its imperial head these past few months. My aim is to map some of the broad contours of Jewish native encounters from the middle of the 19th century to the middle of the 20th. Along the way, I'm going to focus on two starkly contrasting individuals who I think neatly capture the specific change over time that I want to illustrate as I try to make uh, some sense in the changing postures that American Jews have taken towards indigenous people uh, over that century and, of course, in due time up to the present. Jewish men were uh, generally drawn to the West. Men, I say in particular, for its commercial opportunities as peddlers and in a job that we don't have anymore called sutlers. These were uh, people who followed infantry brigades around to provision them with foodstuffs and with dry goods. These were itinerant travelers, traders, who were brought into direct contact, direct business contact with indigenous suppliers and producers, as well as coal miners, farmers, freemen, boomtowners, women. And when they accumulated enough capital, they tended to generally establish these larger uh, general merchandising businesses and consolidated these larger zones of trade, uh, typically moving to an urban center where they could participate in Jewish communal life and settle down with families. So peddling was a kind of starter job in the startup world of the 19th century. And the genesis of Jewish business success in small towns throughout this country should be located, I think, at least in part in indigenous business relations. So in, in out West or the many versions of the West, Jews enjoyed um, most of the privileges of whiteness and took advantage of the benefits of American liberalism. Motility, the ability to move around uh, unencumbered by the state, by the absence of government interference into their religious practices or their businesses, and emerging state laws that aim to protect their well being and their property and to secure a future for them as individual citizens. As a whole, of course, Native Americans, like you know, were not granted citizenship until 1924, uh, the very same year that Congress shut immigration gates to Jews altogether. Jews, in the broad sense, were simply a part of the broad culture of settlement, or what we can call settler colonialism. They tended to see Native Americans in one of two ways. First, as impediments to their commercial and settlement aspirations. Violence and the threat of violence were real, given the broad fight over the land and its resources, the creation and mobilization of a large military presence, of immigration policy, of treaty making, all these things that were aimed to make the lands west of the Mississippi available to Europeans and the already American settlers. 
Jews were violent uh, at times. They applauded this violence, justified it at times, and they sometimes participated in vigilante violence as well, to which the state most often turned a blind eye. Jews reproduced myths of Indians as bloodthirsty, savage, and all the rest, some of which they had learned from popular presses, from novels and plays in German and Yiddish that they had consumed before they had migrated here. Uh, it's some from letters received back home from the yet to migrate from those who already had siblings or cousins that went. In his Frontier California Nevada Diary, for example, a guy named David Danconda articulated an all too common and very gendered racist tweet that he described as he described for himself in his journal why he didn't like to do business with the native people he encountered. The women do chores and the lazy men eat what they earn, he wrote. The noble red man in his forest glades, painted and tattooed, brandishing his hallmark a la, lament for, a la lamented forest, may be romantic and interesting. But the noble red man, painted and tattooed, dressed in dirty overalls and linen dusters, loafing on doorsteps, and the noble red woman in frosty cast-off finery are simply disgusting. Now, when Jews weren't seeing Native Americans as impediments, they saw them as vehicles to achieve their own aspirations for economic mobility and for social belonging in the West. On a practical level, Native Americans were Jews' customers and business partners, the Conda in included. But Native America also provided Jewish uh, customers and, uh, sorry, it also provided Jews out West some of the metaphysical fodder that they use to produce a sense of belonging, of becoming American through celebrating their connections with Native Americans, with honorifics, by telling stories about, say, being taken captive or being adopted or going Native. I listened to one interview taken with an Oklahoma pioneer in 1937 from the Works Administration Project with a fellow who told a story about this guy named Sam Brown who died at the age of 100 the year before in 1936. A Jewish boy of five years old, quoting here, Brown had begged a band of Uchis who were making their way to Indian territory after their removal to take him along. Brown lived with them, was adopted into their tribe. He later became a treasurer of the Creek Nation and a member of the House of Kings in a place called Wilika near Leonard, Oklahoma. And the husband to both the Creek wife and later the Yargi woman. Now, the interview interviewee described the tri tribal funeral, this rich detail, all day long services of burial ceremonies and feasting, and the leading men of four tribes paying homage. One other quick example might be made of the Texas born Herman Lehman, captured by Apaches near his home in 1869 at age 10, uh, who learned to speak a dialect of Southern Athabascan and participated in Apache raids of settler towns. Caught by Texas Rangers a few years later, he escaped to Comanche territory where he lived by the name of Monteca before he was eventually, quote, discovered as white and was persuaded to return uh, by none other than Comanche chief Connor Parker himself. Uh, he'd eventually become part of the Loyal Valley settlement and was uh, eulogized as, quote, a good citizen who knows it was wrong to commit murder and that no amount of provocation under any circumstances could be induced to shed a fellow man's blood. Curiously, this Monteca fellow was placed on the tribal rolls for the convention in 1901 and was granted 160 acres in Garfield, Oklahoma, which he eventually gave to a school. Though so he later appeared in county fairs and rodeos and eventually wrote a very popular book called Nine Years Among the Indians. So let me give you a few more details about the life of one particular figure. His name is Otto Mears and the literature of remembrance that grew about him as a way of talking about the ways that Jews utilize Native Americans to achieve these twin ends of mobility uh, and belonging. So it's a story both about his actions and about the ways that these were subsequently memorialized. Uh, I think that it reveals some of the ways that Jewish immigrant integration into the West was directly wrapped up in the lives and the fates of many Native Americans. So Mears emigrated from uh, Latvian Curland in 1852 
He moved to Germany, from Germany to New York, uh, and soon found his way to the frontier in search of opportunity. In age 19, in 1861, he joined the Company H of the 1st Regiment of California Volunteers right over across the bay uh, at the time. Um, like other Jews who enlisted for both Indian Wars and the Civil War, I found dozens of soldiers' names, Jewish soldiers' names, over the course of these decades who served and who died. California, actually, quite a number. Edward Johnson, Benjamin Mordecai, M.K. Moses. Like these others, Mears saw gaining military experience as a noble route to legitimation as an American. So for three years during the Civil War, Mears served under the famous Kit Carson in his campaign against the Navajo in New Mexico. After his discharge, he worked as a clerk for a series of German Jewish merchant firms. Uh, and there and then in Arizona, he opened his own trading post, later another one in Conojos, Colorado, and basically like parlayed success upon success as a merchandiser, as a farmer and land speculator, as a road builder, eventually a railway builder and developer. Like other German speaking Jewish immigrants to the Western frontier, Mears was not a lone actor, but a man who was very thoroughly connected by a network of religious and linguistic and filial connections. The state of Colorado hired Mears as an interpreter in 1873 to work on failing negotiations between Ure, the chief of the Ute, and Felix Bruneau, uh, chairman of the Board of Indian Commissioners in its effort to secure contiguous uh, land, um, uh, Ute land. Um, the land grab, like most of its time, was justified in the language of productivity since linking together newly acquired tracts of land was key for commercial development. One local newspaper at the time opined that these lands were, quote, only a beautiful, broad expanse of meadowland over which the Utes hold unconditioned control. But these favorite grounds of the Utes would, if occupied by us whites, become one of the richest and most productive grain and fruit growing counties in the West. A member of the state legislator argued directly, a quote, that all of the Ute territory brings no revenue to the government. On the contrary, the natives are supported at great expense. The same land thrown open to settlement would support many rich, prosperous communities that would return to the national government. So of course, the struggle over the land was fierce and it was two-sided. New hostilities arose in the fall of 1797 when the Utes at the White River Agency killed Nathan Meeker and eight Indian sub-agents, including incidentally at least one Jew named Carl Goldstein. Several settlers were taken into captivity and Mears was hired to serve as a negotiator to secure the release of the captives. Now in the wake of what's known as this, the Meeker massacre, popular sentiment in Colorado supported very intensely the forced removal of the remaining Utes from their land. It was rumored that Mears himself privately circulated among them, quote, giving $2 in silver to sign away land rights. For this, he was brought up on bribery charges, was ordered to stand trial in Washington, where he went and was not only exonerated, but paid as reimbursed for his, for his layouts for the land. Later local Jewish history books champion the ways that Mears and his fellow pioneers had wrestled control away from the painted red wards of Uncle Sam, who guarded every acre with a jealous eye. That's quote two, of course. After the government took control over the land, Mears helped uh, find what they had called suitable reservation lands for the Ute along the Green River, the present site of the Uinta Reservation in Utah, and helped build an infrastructure for the new Indian agency there. Then he built private toll roads right across the Arkansas Valley and into San Juan established mining interests, um, securing lucrative mail contracts to supply settlers with tobacco and sugar and coffee. Uh, and then he started a newspaper uh, in order to promote settlement in the San Luis Valley for new settlers. With his considerable wealth by the mid seventies, he began building the Rio Grande Southern, one of the several Mears own railroads to link up the resources of the mountain west with the markets on both coasts. Mears was, in short, a very active participant in various stages in the forced removal um, uh, of distinct Native American nations at the dispossession of their lands, 
subsequent containment and the commercialization of the newly acquired and sometimes untreated lands. So his ascendance from a orphaned immigrant to an Indian war soldier, and then from a settlement broker to a very wealthy and eventually elected member of the Colorado legislature, is remembered sometimes now as a founding father of the state of Colorado, rode on these key pieces of colonial settlement. Now celebrations of Mears and others like him, in him particular, both as a businessman as a so-called pacifier of the Indians, would be frequently repeated in the popular press and in local history works after their deaths. Jewish journalists, uh, amateur historians of the West, um, from the last decade of the 19th century, like all the way through to the 40s, celebrated Mir's triumph over Indians in acquisition of their lands as a means of emphasizing Jewish belonging in both a physical geographic landscape, as well as kind of emotionally, socially, effectively in part of the national spirit. I hadn't really thought of them, I hadn't sought them out when I uh, scoured the Jewish archives for sources about Native Americans for this project, but I found no shortage of glory stories like these, some of which are actually quite gory. Stories which were meant to transmit messages by Jews for Jews about Jews, Jews who lynched, who shot, who scalped Native Americans. There were, of course, success stories of Jews who acquired Indian land without recourse to violence like Lewis Wolf, an Alsatian immigrant to Temecula, California, not too far from here, who was a major property owner, was later dubbed the King of Temecula, and was the model for Helen Hunt Jackson's character, Jim, Jim Harstell, in a very famous best-selling 1884 a reformer and activist novel called Ramona, which probably did more than any other text at the time um, to uh, educate Americans about the plight of American Indians. There are um, um, place names that have borne the honor of Jewish settlers near here too. Um, Garberville, California in Humboldt County named after the postmaster Jacob Garber or Beaver, California that's up in Modoc territory named for the shopkeeper Nathan Beaver. Stories about men like these regularly circulated in local Jewish histories and obituaries, and personal letters and memoirs, not just in California, but in Alaska in Arizona and in Missouri and Montana and Nebraska and Nevada and New Mexico and Texas and Wyoming all over the place. Two generations of Jewish communal record keeping and local historical consciousness situated Jews at the center of what cultural historian and the, of the American frontier Richard Slotkin has called narratives of regeneration through violence. Stories about Jewish victimization from Indian cruelties, as they were called, also circulated. They mirrored and kind of reversed the stories of violent perpetration, but they kind of resulted in the same conclusions, the same narrative plots. They explained and they justified the seizure of Native American lands and the sacrifices that warranted and sanctified imperial victory, a certain kind of American libertarianism. And telling stories of both varieties, Jews identified Jews identified as model national subjects who took up the charge of settling and colonizing and Americanizing the land. They perpetrated violence and fell victim to it, not as Jews per se, but as part of the bigger settler population. Yet Jews wrote about these participations as acts of Jewish sacrifice and descriptions of ways that it made Jews fit for the, uh, uh, the expansion enterprise, fusing um, uh, sorry, that they, they wrote about these as a way to kind of strike against the myth that they lacked the brawn to make it in the project of rugged, you know, expansion, expansionist project. So they fused physical violence and political might. Jews wrote with a, a proud awareness of the reversal of what they perceived as their recent experience in Europe where they had suffered as the colonists. These narratives of perpetration and victimhood earned Western Jews a sense of home among an emerging nation of whites. Uh, they were acts that were meant to end the exile. Now, as Jewish as scholars, sorry, as scholars of indigenous history have shown in great detail, displacement was devastating on Native American communities, disrupted traditional knowledge and practice, 
changed food, economics, culture, and language. And of course, had a massive death and disease and trauma toll. While Native American communities tended to suffer geographic dislocation and political disorder in the West, Jews achieved stunning social mobility, religious latitude, and relative economic security, and they created scores of new communities. In the words of William Toll, a Pacific Coast historian, for Jewish men, the merchant role in the West enabled them and their families in a single generation to move from medieval artisanship and itinerant merchandising to the highest civil status. But within a few short decades after the so-called closing of the frontier, the plot line of Jewish Native American relations pivoted rather dramatically. With a violent contest for land largely over, enfranchised and now mostly American-born Jews of the mid 20th century, East Coast people, lawyers, anthropologists, linguistic educators, journalists, even a few rabbis, expanded, expended considerable effort at what they called Indian uplift and promoted some of the most effective tools of progressive pro-native ideology and policy that America had created today. So shifting gears here, you'll see the great contract that I've been saying from now. To help characterize this next very different sort of Jewish Native American encounter, let me introduce you to a second figure, the lawyer, legislator, and advocate for Native American rights, Felix Cohen. Born in 1907 in Yonkers, the son of a very famous legal philosopher, Morris Raphael Cohen, Felix was one of the significant number of Jews who devoted money and time and energy and political capital and to expertise to various efforts aimed at improving the lives of American Indians during the middle of decades of the 20th century. His work kind of crystallizes uh, the work of an entire cadre of mid-century uh, Jewish liberals. Some of them are socialists, some of them are progressives. Um, their work and their sensibilities as they helped fashion the Roosevelt administration's Indian New Deal in the 1930s under the leadership of a non-Jewish commissioner of American Indians in the Department of Interior, a guy named John Collier. These Jews worked with the top echelons of leadership, drafting federal policy, shaping American Indian law. They helped launch, fund, and staff some of the most important not-for-profit efforts aimed at advancing Native Americans of the day, including the Association on American Indian Affairs, the Indian Rights Association, the National Congress for American Indians, the Indian Defense Association, and many more. John Collier's son took note that's of local interest here writing that, quote, my father was remarkably adroit at, in gathering donations, and he approached his own upper echelon, uh, upper class, with a demanding confidence. His most loyal patrons included a circle of wealthy Jewish lawyers and civil servants from right here in San Francisco, why I picked that quote. The donors and leaders here shared and were shaped by a common sociology of community, community organizing, of faith in the law as a vehicle for social change, and of a kind of Jewish sensibility inculcated by their socialization and communal attachment. They worked on Indian affairs even after the demise of the Indian New Deal into the conservative uh, post-World War II period that's known in Native American historiography as termination, deep into the 1960s and well beyond that. Leo Rabinowitz, for example, directed the American Indian Defense Organization of Central and Northern California for a good decade. The Jewish lawyers and lobbyists, Nathan uh, Arthur Lazarus and Marvin Sanofsky worked closely with North Carolina's Jewish Senator Sam Irvin to ensure that the Indian Civil Rights Act of 1968 certain, uh, adequately safeguarded tribal autonomy, particularly with respect to reservations, self-policing, and certain aspects of criminal jurisdiction. There was the Marshall Trust, and it's the Marshall Trust and the other, other organizations 1965 contributions list included 65 individual Jewish donors, including organizational donors as well, like from synagogues, Jewish synagogues uh, in California. There were really tons of examples that I could draw on here, but the evidence is really just meant to illustrate the pretty straightforward point that mid-century American Jews were engaged in a rich and complex and meaningful action with their, with their words and with their deeds, with their feet, a critique of American imperialism uh, and of its past government's mistreatment of Native Americans. And they played what I think is a major part 
in many of the first and earliest sort of serious attempt to serious attempt at redress uh, using the tools of the state itself. Jews' efforts both inside and outside government shows that Jews played an outsized role in establishing some of the key institutions and the techniques and the organizations that Native American leaders would themselves use to expand their power and capacity later in the 60s and thereafter. Enfranchised Jews working in law firms, the station's capital and not-for-profits, academic institutions were pretty sincere in their wishes to improve the lives of communities of Native Americans around the country, just as they had for the rights and enrichment uh, of many American minorities, Native African Americans, most famously among them. And for these liberals, uh, liberal Jewish actors, advancing Native American was but one prong in a broader goal of advancing all groups, they said, whose rights and cultural self-determination needed securing and ensuring that individuals from all groups would receive the same protections from the law to shape their own cultural and economic and religious destinies. And they were really committed to these values in a way that um, just seems foreign now. From his coming of age uh, until his death at the young age of 46, Felix Cohen's intellectual and political pursuits centered on Indian rights. He and his wife, Lucy Kramer Cohen, was an anthropologist trained by the Jewish godfathers of American anthropology, Franz Boas and Edward Sapir. She remained active and connected to the group of Boas and Sapir's largely Jewish students who put the anti-racist cultural relativist discipline on the map and put them into American universities by focusing by and large on Native American subjects, which is a really another fascinating reading place of Jewish Native American history, but that's a topic for another time. Cohen's vision for Indian Renaissance was of a piece with the most progressive strand of non-Native ideas for Natives at the time. The Department of the Interior tapped this group of young lawyers, including Cohen, including Nathan Margold, half a dozen other Jews, a few Gentiles, and one Mormon, and authorized them to begin working on major legislation to try to reverse problems that had been associated with all these assimilationist policies that had been in effect since the Dawes General Allotment Act of 1877. Their brainchild was the Indian Reorganization Act, the IRA, uh, which is also known as the Wheeler Howard Act, passed in 1934. And it was the first federal Indian policy in more than 100 years that did not have the explicit purpose of undermining the status of Indian nation. On the contrary, the IRA aimed to fundamentally reformulate national Indian policy to set the government's goal as the establishment of Indian self-governance and to provide Native American communities with sufficient authority and powers to represent reservation populations. It aimed to promote cultural pluralism, tribal sovereignty. Um, among its many provisions, the IRA ended the practice of dividing up reservation lands into small parcels and giving them to individual Indians to farm or to sell and allowed Native Americans to voluntarily exchange allotments so that Native groups could consolidate lands instead of living on this checkerboard reservation. It restored tribal ownership to uh, remaining surplus lands created by the implementation of the allotment system, like hundreds of thousands of acres, and provided Indians with economic aid and appropriated annual funds for the acquisition of additional land for the landless. The IRA was also um, uh, it was law uh, only for tribes who voluntarily opted in and wanted to be governed by it. So tribes had the right to exclude themselves from the provisions of the federal law. It's very interesting, if they wished, because the drafters didn't want to include the IRA and be like one more bit of top-down legislation. Tribes that accepted the IRA could draft constitutions defining their own powers of self-government, establish business charters that permitted them to borrow money from a big revolving credit fund. More than two thirds of eligible tribes, there's a lot of ineligible tribes, a different kind of problem, but two thirds of the eligible ones voted to accept the IRA and more than a third wrote constitutions, some of which this guy Felix Cohen himself uh, helped to draft. The IRA perhaps most radically authorized tribal councils established under the act itself to negotiate with and to litigate against the federal government, against the state government, against local governments, uh, in what would soon be established as the Indian Claims Commission, the ICC, a kind of parallel uh, court 
that tribes could sue the government for damages. So that come on. Uh -huh. The Indian Reorganization Act was an, an unusually liberal gesture of Congress that legislators create in that they created laws that rescinded government powers, not as an attempt to shrink government agencies like we see for right-leaning ideological reasons, but in order to provide redress to its own failings, aware that the impacts of centuries of law and policy in war had made on Native Americans. The opportunities made available to tribes under this act were in the assessment of Native American legal historians Vine Deloria Jr. and Clifford Little immense. Cohen's accomplishments went still further. He established and redacted the Federal Handbook on American Indian Law in 1940, which was a compendium resource for all of the states and the federal legal proceedings on matters of American Indian law to date, a book that became known as the quote, Bible for the American Indian Bar. And after he left government service, he implemented the IRA as an attorney hired by tribes to represent them in their legal battles against the government at the, I, at the ICC that he helped establish. So he and actually many other Jewish litigators won hundreds of millions of dollars in awards for their uh, client tribes. There was uh, actually a legal process uh, as, mm, there was a legislative process as well as a litigious one for earning monetary recompense for Native peoples, I should point out. Arthur Lazarus, whom I mentioned earlier, drafted the Native version of what became the landmark Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act, which was perhaps the largest cash settlement for extinguishing a land title that ever been negotiated between a, conquer a conquering sovereign and its indigenous people anywhere in the world, just under a billion dollars in 1971. For his part, Cohen wrote dozens of articles, editorials, and letters to editors of major American newspapers concerning contemporary legislative issues that were of import to Native Americans, ceaselessly observing misconceptions about indigenous people and calling out that there's unfair treatment of their communities. We have disposed of them, he wrote, spiritually by denying their existence as a people, by taking myth, taking refuge in the myth of the vanishing Indian, or by blaming our grandfathers for the wrongs we commit. In this way, we have often assured ourselves that our national sins are of purely antiquarian significance. They are not. Now, Cohen saw his Indian advocacy work as inextricably linked with the work of defending all minorities, and Jews were very much on his radar. He coupled nearly all of his appeals for anti-discrimination law and public opinion about Jews with appeals on behalf of other American minorities. Like other Jews in his cohort, he worked on Jewish immigration and minority recognition issues. He worked with American Jewish causes, a slew of US organizations, most centrally the American Jewish Committee, but also in other places around the world, he worked with France's Alliance Israel Universelle and Britain's Anglo-Jewish Association. He penned one of the very earliest memoranda on the, on the prevention of discrimination and protection of minorities ever submitted to the UN's Commission on Human Rights. He was also explicit in his writing about why. He argued that Jewish and Native American traditions were at the root of the most elemental and virtuous qualities of America itself. It's interesting. In one address he gave to graduating law students at Yale that he called the meaning of Americanism, Cohen aimed to elucidate the sources that he thought lay at the heart of America's noblest virtues. The twin influences, surprisingly, or not surprisingly tonight, of Judaism and Native American culture. On the one hand, he judged American's foundational ideal, its core moral imperative, to be the Hebrew Bible's injunction to care for the stranger. This beckoning, according to Cohen, undergirded the very best of the nation's attitude towards immigration, its social welfare innovations, its domestic public policy. It animated America's purpose. Yet in order to operationalize the foundational ideal in, in practical terms, it had to be combined with the second influence, which was what he called the nation's spirit of tolerance, which he located in the Iroquois or the Haudenosaunee Confederacy that I mentioned uh, 30 minutes ago, the indigenous political pact that had long enshrined the cooperation of the five nations, the Mohawk, Naida, Onondaga, Cayuga, Seneca, and later a sixth nation, the Tuscarora nation, so-called people of the longhouse. Admiring the skills that Native Americans had 
at forming political confederations, he said, underwrote the expedience and the wisdom necessary for America's very system of government, its libertarian yet communalistic tolerance. Cohen, in other words, traced the two most fundamental ingredients for his version of America's highest ideal to Jews on the one hand and to Native Americans on the other. Now, he paired his investments in Jewish and Indian issues throughout his career as well in practical terms. His Indian advocacy began in the shadow of the rise of the Nazi power in the 1930s, right up to his death in 1953. Reflecting back on two decades of his Indian and Jewish advocacy worth just months before his death, he gave further voice to the motivations that drove his work. He noted, we have a vital concern with Indian self-government because the Native American is to America what the Jew was to the Russian czars and to Hitler's Germany. For us, the Indian tribe, for us Americans, the Indian tribe is the miner's canary. And when it flutters and droops, we know that the poison gases of intolerance threaten all other minorities in our land. Yet Cohen's and his Jewish colleagues' advocacy efforts were circumscribed. These Jews lacked both the intimate knowledge of and deep existential ties to Native American experiences, their languages, their attachments to their own lands, their own visions for their own futures. The intellectual and political perspectives that these mid-century Jews assumed to be good for all American minorities, they called, quote, minorities, including an almost sacrosanct view of state liberalism and ide idealistic confidence in the tools of lobbying and policymaking and the law to affect change. They limited these Jews' contributions to shaping Native Americans' well-beings and their communities' futures as they themselves might have wished it. Their work also betrayed some of the assimilationist impulses that American Jews just sort of accepted as a fundamental given of the American Jewish experience. On a basic level, they assumed that all so-called minorities shared a vision for a more inclusive nation. When these Jewish professionals grappled with the terrible impacts of colonialism on indigenous communities, they assumed that Native Americans were in a way uh, like, their, like other immigrant groups, uh, like immigrant minority groups themselves. So they didn't put forth any kind of vision for decolonizing America, did not speak of Native Americans as, an, as, a, as autonomous nations, as able to engage in nation to nation relations. They were far less vociferous about ensuring the full expression of Native Americans' political self-determination. They also based some of their interventions less on deeply informed indigenous ways of knowing and more on the things that they did know about. The tribal constitutions that Cohen wrote, for example, were primarily based on ideas about municipal governments, about city politics, not the deeply rooted political customs of the specific tribes to which they were offered as. They assumed that money could be substituted for land, perhaps best exemplified by the Black Hills Sioux land case, which Marvin Sanofsky and Arthur Lazar, both people I've mentioned earlier, the lawyers who were hired to represent the Sioux for a 27 year long case, both in and out of courts that ran from 53 to 1980, when they finally convinced the court that the US had illegally stole the Black Hills back in 1877. They won a settlement of $105 million, only to have the cash settlement rejected by the Sioux. By the, Sioux. the payment, which is now valued at about $1.5 billion, is still on offer. It's still rejected. The cash can't replace the land, and they wanted the land, something that these guys just couldn't really wrap their heads around. Again, more broadly, Jews like Cohen pursued a politics of justice through incorporation into the benefits and the virtues of America using and trusting the tools of the state itself. They certainly grappled with the painful legacies of colonization of Native America, but they also did so in ways that made sense to them as Jews and in ways that fit their own commitments to liberalism and the framework of national pluralism. Still, I'd say Cohen campaigned for American Indian legal rights and recognition more intensely than any other American Jew before or since, and more than most other non-Natives had in all of American history, I think it's safe to say. And he did so with some measure of Jewish self-consciousness. His identification with Native American issues illustrated in a concentrated manner how these mid-century liberal Jews tried to mediate between 
political insiders and minority outsiders between power and powerlessness. And occupying this kind of middle ground uh, served several uh, functions. It allowed enfranchised Jews like Cohen and the lawyers and the boosters and the board members of a panoply of Indian rights organizations, people who are still absorbed with the memory of recent historic experience of Jewish disempowerment to feel both settled in America and Jewish by quote, identifying down sociology term with Americans whose, collect whose collective corporate faith had, feel had fared far worse than, than had the Jews. It allowed Jews to enact their devotion to liberalism and foster the kind of American institutions that they believed uh, were important, tolerance, equity, uh, the rule of law, and the protection and the preservation of minority rights. These outcomes they believed would just secure the brightest future for America and for all of its minorities, because they had seen the ways that these principles of American liberalism had served their families and their communities. Okay, that's my second case. But to be sure, there are many other uh, interesting theaters into which Jews and Native Americans met and imagined and discussed one another into which we might dive that emerged at specific moments of the 20th and 21st century about there's almost no scholarship at all. The 19 teens, 20s and 30s was home to an elaborate discussion about race and biology and character. During this time, Jewish scientists and civic leaders discussed the relative placement of Jews to American Indians in race thinking and eugenics. Much of their use of American Indians in this time centered around immigration restriction and nativism and xenophobia about who was fit to be American to immigrate. There was also and remains a very tense debate about comparative genocide that began in the 1960s. There were many subsets of business and cultural encounters around casinos, around the energy sector, and artistic and cultural products. There's much to say about Jewish and Native Americans entanglements about spirituality, about land-based religion, about environmentalism. Most recently, there's a tense new discourse that's emerged about Israel-Palestine and the idea of indigeneity, of who's indigenous to that place. And a parallel and fraught debate about Jews and colonialism over there, here on Turtle Island, there's emerged a number of fascinating grassroots efforts to confront the legacies of colonialism's impact on indigenous people from a distinctly Jewish perspective and Jewish justice internationally. Um, I, I wonder if some of you were part of the Jews on Ohlone Lands, a volunteer collective of Jewish community that centers allyship with Nishan Ohlone, part of emphasizing traditional land, land-focused Jewish wisdom. Some of you may have even attended an indigenous solidarity workshop held just a couple of days ago with Wilderness Torah right before Yom Kippur. Um, if you are, I'd like to hear about it. Perhaps some of you know about the uh, the Sagorate Land Trust, which is an initiative for settlers here in uh, Ohlone territory to voluntarily contribute to a land tax or have already given this year. Um, perhaps you're involved with or know about the local urban Adama or the Kihila Community Synagogue. I love what all you do if people are part of that. What you might not know is that initiatives like these are springing up across the continent. And the number of programs, of events, of committees, of resolutions, land acknowledgements, film screenings, and Holocaust programs, and op eds, and family history projects, and plays, and novels, and podcasts have exploded over the last 10 years. And they display out in a really interesting and busy number of directions, Massachusetts, New Mexico, and British Columbia. From progressive First Nations oriented Passover Seders, land back novels, um, uh, to the Jews of Turtle Island community of practice, to right of center uh, discussions about Native Americans and First Nations and Metis leaders, for example, which talk about Israel and indigeneity. The contemporary discussion now involves not just social justice folks, self-described Jewish radicals, but Jews across the entire political spectrum and Jews from every single religious denomination, excluding the ultra-Orthodox. There are even efforts to begin to tell stories of people who identify as both indigenous and Jewish, indigenous converts, or the many humans who have one indigenous and one Jewish parent. 
and with your at the intersection. But at this point, I want to steer us towards some of the broad conclusions that I think can be drawn from the two encounters that I focused on today. The Jews of the frontier West who acted as agents of colonialism and the Jews who uh, promoted inclusion and economic mobility. Sorry, the Jews who expanded considerable effort at Indian uplift and promoted these effective tools. Perhaps the biggest and thorniest implication from that arises from the change over time that I've presented tonight is that rather than see American Jewish history as part of an immigration story, it might be more accurate to see Jewish immigration as part and parcel of the complex history of colonial history, part of really the global histories of displacement and the incredible geographic rearrangements that reshape the lives and locations of so many millions. We get something new when we see ethnic and religious communities migration histories from the vantage point of those who were most dramatically impacted by mass migration. And this is not just an American story. Indeed, we need to ask questions about these same processes with respect to Canada, where I live, to Latin America and the Caribbean, to Australia and New Zealand, pockets of Southern Africa, where lots of also Jewish modernity in the there's a broad insight about Jewish history that I think comes from this research. I think that there are limits to the basic framework in which the field of modern Jewish history is generally cast, which is about emancipation, too centered on Western Europe. In the so-called New World, citizenship rights were never really up for debate and were never really a problem for Jews. Jewish immigrants moved for them in fact. They also migrated for food and for security and for religious latitude. But the liberalism of these new world countries like the United States, they worked and the conditions for Jewish migration became possible because of global capital expansion, because of the resources that European empires captured. And so the Jewish movement around the globe was simply has to be seen as part of the context that made it possible. The central insight that I think arises from attunement to the specific Jewish indigenous relationship is that the American Jewish past is really burdened because the history of multinational mass migration that produced America is the history of colonialism. Immigration, even for refugees, is colonial history. They're flip sides of the same coin. American Jewish history not, needs to be seen not just as a heroic story of immigrant ascent and accomplishment, a part of the juggernaut of colonial modernity. The massive wave of immigration that relocated millions of Jews from Europe and Asia to its peripheries over the long 19th century was a transformation that I think was as profound as any in the history of the Jews. And it's into this context that I think Jewish history ought to be understood, part of the history of conflict and contest. The story that I've told this afternoon Likewise complicates the long history, the long romance of Jews and liberalism, because it shows quite acutely and perhaps a bit painfully that Jewish devotion to liberalism has included its most noble and its most promiscuous elements, widening the aperture of Canadian Jewish history to include the really uncomfortable fact of colonialism doesn't entirely undo the story that we know and tell about American Jewish life about immigrant success and immigrant success story, but it does complicate it. The fact that Jews were among the colonizers in a process that clearly harmed indigenous people and lives does not alter the fact that Jews, the need, the, the need that Jews felt to emigrate from Europe and Russia. It doesn't alter the tribulations or the accomplishments of Jews once arrived, but it does ask us to contend with these politics and to consider the consequences for Jews, for indigenous people, perhaps even for some fundamental ideas about America itself. Thank you. Thank you for braving the cold as well with it. You have a low battery problem. Yeah. I think, well, first of all, thank you. Um, I'm Professor Tessa Mata. For anyone who uh, showed up late, um, I focus on American Indians and tribal sovereignty. That's most of my work. Um, 
really want to hear from you folks, though. If you have questions, even if you want to stand up and move forward, that would be great, too. Um, but I know it's cold uh, and you're probably still facing. All the more reason to stand up. Yeah, so, so you're more than welcome um, at any point. I'll kick it off, maybe ask them a couple of questions, um, and maybe that'll get your thoughts going, but perhaps not. And um, we can just have an extended conversation right. that you can watch, <laughs> but hopefully not. Um, so, David, first, thank you for a number of different reasons, right? The, the number one reason, and I think this is most applicable um, for those of us in the room who are not Jewish, right, is how when we look at kind of American history, and we situate our own communities in that context, right? Um, whether it be as a Catholic or as um, a Protestant, <laughs> or even more specifically as a more recent immigrant community, right? How do we kind of start this process, this historical um, reckoning, as we've kind of done? And I think uh, it's serving as a model that um, we have a lot to learn from. So maybe if you could talk a little bit about that first, and then. Of course, maybe I have some details or questions about Felix Cohen and, and you know, nitty gritty sure. stuff, I guess. So, um, you know, I, I, there's, there are progressives that I know um, who call themselves settlers um, and say, you know, introduce themselves as a child or you know, something. And, uh, but, but most people don't identify this way. Um, and most people don't identify themselves as white either. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I guess the, the thinking was to sort of disaggregate this big group of white settlers uh, into the categories uh, that are organic to the people themselves. Like what, what, what matters to your own sense of who you are and think about that, that group's relationship with American history of how they got here. And I think the specific study here, which is about, you know, I basically was curious, you know, for reasons that didn't have to do with the conclusion of my study uh, about where Jews and Native Americans might have interacted. And I knew nothing about what I would argue about it. I just went to tons of archives, tons of Jewish archives and like looked for, looked for Indians basically. And I went to tons of Indian archives and oral histories and collections and for Jews and I just amassed kind of big pile like big old big pile of sources and tried to make sense of it and what I had to conclude when I looked at it was that oh this is really a story about about colonialism about different Jewish attitudes towards colonialism and how they were Jews were working through their own immigrant and religious and community needs um, through a kind of partly imagined Indian and actual some of the people that they had real human interactions with that had to do with sex and money and violence and all that kind of stuff. And so this kind of conclusion uh, uh, really grew out of a desire to look at the sources and didn't start with a, you know, with an effort to locate Jews in the colonial encounter. Um, but I'm hopeful and thank you. I mean, it, I, I don't know if it will serve as a model, but I think it could serve as a model and perhaps, you know, Mormons and Asian Americans, you know, and all kinds of, you know, groups who people feel really committed to and have long, interesting, varied histories could do their own kind of study like this and come up with probably some similar overall conclusions, but very different ones that also look different from the general story we know about all the just whites in general, which is usually a story about the state and not about the people in the, the country. So I just make one or other comment about this, that in Canada, there's a like um, indigenous settler relations is really a big part of the um, public conversation in a way that it's not in the United States. Um, and there was a process, a, a several year truth and reconciliation process that was underwent and they released this big uh, report, which included 94 recommendations that many Canadian institutions are really taking very seriously about how to implement. And all of them are, all of the recommendations, like the audience for the recommendations were all like state institutions, public schools, libraries, whatever, like health institutions. Um, and I find it really remarkable that, that they weren't, they weren't, none of the recommendations are addressed different 
community, different religious communities, different ethnic communities, who also have so much work to do because as individual citizens, you don't really relate to the state. The state does what it does, it's over there. So I think some of the work of reconciliation might be better served. I mean, there is government stuff and policy stuff that obviously has to happen, but there's a kind of cultural and human conversation that also has to happen. And that has to happen between, you know, between indigenous people and and the settlers who act as their own, you know, in their own kind of organic identity terms. Mm -hmm. So hopefully we'll see some of that and, and hopefully it'll make a difference. Yeah, thank you. I mean, I think um, it gives voice to a lot of what we hear, at least in the classroom here at USF, right? So we all know land acknowledgements can be a little bit performative and my, my I don't necessarily, and I'm not saying me because I actually am California Indian, but, but I, you know, my social location as a young person in a classroom kind of um, thinking about indigenous people and I have no necessarily proximity to them and I don't really see or they're, they are a them, right? They're someone else. So what is my role in that? And like, what is my role in helping facilitate some kind of justice? Um, I think can oftentimes be a big obstacle. And so I think when, as uh, Aaron mentioned the first, the very opening, right? Talked about um, how do we actually activate, right? Make into a program some of the social action um, how do we kind of translate these theories of justice or ideas into action and practice? Um, and so I think it's something that we struggle with. And here at USF, we're struggling with it because we're finally starting to say, oh, hmm, we're a Jesuit institution, <laughs> right? We've got a, a kind of a history in San Francisco, this long story history from the 1850s. Um, what, what is our relationship to the indigenous community, right? So this is the conversation that we're trying to start um, having on campus and we're getting some support for it. But it is that historical digging and that depth that you've um, done in your own work that I think is really just quite significant. And I'm a huge convert. If you, I know you weren't trying to convert, but now <laughs> I want to proselytize because his book is actually quite informative in this regard. Um, and I think can be used for multiple purposes that are not necessarily just specifically, you know, um, within Judaic studies. Or yeah. anything. <laughs> I did, uh, I, um, I, I, I'm, I'm, I teach history at my university back home. and. And we have like a public history program. I was encouraging students to do public history stuff. And I was a couple of weeks ago was um, was invited to a um, um, to a uh, uh, public reckoning that was born out of somebody did a public public history project about um, quotas that limited the number of Jews that were allowed into medical schools uh, in the 1920s and 30s and 40s into the 50s, uh, you know, like really smart, talented kids who just like would have had careers and been surgeons and people who would have helped a lot of people who just, just like, that's it, like no more Jews allowed. And the there was a, like a big anti-Semitic brouhaha at the medical school and the, the medical school itself and the Jewish studies center hired a postdoc and she researched the quota system and wrote like a proper short story that described what happened. And because it was, as it was basically research that was paid for by the institution, mm -hmm. when she put it back to the people who had hired her to do it essentially, they had no choice but to do a really big public acknowledgement about this very shameful part of they had, you know, dean of the practice of medicine and the CEOs of like the five major hospitals that have research, you know, research facilities attached to the to med school. And they did like this big, big, big program and, you know, made this apologies and committed money to different kinds of inclusivity practices now. I, I say it simply because the doing the work at this, it would be awesome to have someone that the university is interested, oh, we should be doing more. Okay, instead of like penning the exact terms of the land acknowledgement, have the university find someone or a group of students or grad students or undergraduate students, whatever, like go into the university archives, they're probably just down the hill and do, do a history of Jesuit indigenous relations. They go back 150 years here. Like you're gonna find some stuff that's pretty interesting and pretty damning and perhaps some conversation that only starts in the 60s or the 70s where we're 
trying to vaguely think about it and present it back to them and they'll have no choice but to do something about it. So I use this example, it's just a great new example because you know, as like history students sometimes write little papers and they just look like they're little papers. And in this case, it was a little paper on medical, you know, it was quotas, a little thing that seemed like it was of antiquarian significance from the 40s and 50s, like around 100 years ago. And like, there it did it. Like, all of a sudden, we like, all the CEOs of the hospitals are committing money and making these public gestures. So I think, I think history is a powerful tool. Mm -hmm. And I think the truth part, truth and reconciliation processes matters. And I think it all matters at a local level. And I, I mean, I'm hopeful for this kind of different ethnic and religious groups to do this kind of work, but you probably need someone to go write a whole book about it. But you could do something right here. I mean, it's like ready to go, ready to go. Questions? Comments? <laughs> something that stood out for you as a. Thank you. Were any of you part of these uh these these sort of Jewish activist groups that have been really busy in the last couple of years, couple of weeks, even? So you can tell me about it. I'll find out else. So maybe if I could, so I um one of my first gigs uh when I was in college at San Francisco State. Um, was working for California Indian Legal Services, which at the time was the executive director with a Jewish man named Michael Fe uh, Pfeffer. Um, and actually, I wrote to him, and was because I was again proselytizing. So I've read this great book, you know, you've got to you know hear all about it. And he's like, "Well, that's got a story." He says, "When I my first um, intake, right? As a lawyer, you do intake, right? You talk to your uh, potential future clients. Then my first intake." was with um, a native woman who had in the rural community of Northern California, um, who had a, a collision at an intersection, unmarked intersection. And there was a um, family from out of town, very wealthy family from the Bay Area, who had come up and uh, collided with them at this, again, unmarked intersection. And she said, and I'm really concerned. So he says, well, what's the problem? You know, this is all by fun. She says, well, they've got a very expensive Jewish attorney. And he said, well, I've got news for you. <laughs> I'm a great expensive Jewish attorney too. But it was remarkable because throughout my entire career, right, working in federal Indian law, uh, it has been populated by directing attorneys, um, executive directors, uh, UCLA's program as also uh, headed by Jew um, Carol Goldberg, Right, uh, the influence has been remarkable. So I think you're right. There's this new generation. Like so, you had the three, you know, two generations, and now the third one. It seems people, folks in their 50s, 60s at this point, who have these amazing stories to tell after the uh, New Deal era. Right, um, that we're not seeing written about anywhere. So I'm really curious about where you see this like next chapter because substantively, I think it's quite rich. Um, arena yeah there's so there's so much like kind of tried to hint at it because mm -hmm. it gets more complicated it was it was it was like a i don't know if many of you do graduate research but like at some point you got to figure out like when this when this right, cut off like <laughs> uh, I, um and the, the there's just so many more um, areas of conversation mm -hmm. that do happen and i think like genocide you know like holocaust and israel are, are really big fraught topics i'm not sure that i'm going to write about these um, and or, or this kind of next generation of social justice and law folks. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure either if I will, but um, it, it is. They, they, I don't know. It's, it's interesting, and I think one of the um, interesting challenges for Jewish historians, for Jewish history people, is about how to include people who are like usually communities write community histories about their institutions, mm -hmm. about you know, leaders that are really kind of insiders and people who are just Jews who are doing other things that are not so Jewy mm -hmm. kind of fall away from Jewish history. Mm -hmm. But I think they belong very much in Jewish history, just as I think in you know Native American studies is very focused. Indians in unexpected places, like mm -hmm. Indians not doing Indian things mm -hmm. are part of Native American history. They got to think about, and so, um, so it, it's, 
you know, like when there's something that happens in aggregate, mm -hmm. enough people, then there's something to be said about it. So, yeah, for sure. I think that's that's absolutely the case. And I think at least when we're thinking about different um, generations of attorneys, right? Um, one of the things that you mentioned about the IRA and kind of the other, um, like uh, the, the Indian Claims Commission, right? All these entities that existed around that time. Um, they they were not written, you know. Yes, they were written for the purpose of you know helping secure native rights, but at the same time, they weren't exactly the rights necessarily that the natives themselves wanted. Right? <laughs> so you kind of get this tension where now people look like, oh well, that tribe has a um, Indian Reorganization Act constitution, and that's not right, really considered a good thing because it model the model wasn't culturally relevant or whatever. Right? So it's got all these kind of um, now in hindsight right really sticky kind of underside to it um and then we're kind of in a different moment where attorneys right like california Indian legal services have to turn and say oh wait we have now raised up helped raise up at least this entire generation of native lawyers now right, right? and so now it's their time to kind of take over the organization or play this different role and help define the future for themselves so i feel like we're kind of at this different moment where you know, the role might change. Um, but so one of the things that um, I was curious about though is that how people conceive of themselves, right? So mirrors you talk about kind of as a part of this American expansion project. Um, and we understand the kind of work that he's doing in that context. Um, and it's almost like a legitimation or a assimilation, um, you know, like we are a part of this American project. Um, and his his actions and so forth kind of help secure that. But then with Cohen, like it's why he I mean he was working he's a bureaucrat, right? <laughs> the Bureau of Indian Affairs. I'm just wondering how does you know how do the folks move into these positions in the bureaucracy? Like what drives them to even want to be in that um, play that role or enter that people, context? People like what's going on. Yeah. Uh, I think that these 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 guys were like really sharp go-getters out of law school. They were um, they were sort of marginal. They had limited opportunities. They were not going to get jobs in their best law firms. They were smart as hell. They were bureaucrats, but they were smart as hell. And um, and they were basically tapped to. They were tapped by the Roosevelt administration, which was way more sort of pluralistic and open to like non waspy elites uh, and just smart people, like regardless of their religious or their racial background, than like any American government had ever been. And um, and they they snatched them up and they gave them jobs, but they also kind of found or offered work. Jews gravitated towards these areas of the federal government that like like kind of odd corners mm -hmm. that were not well established which is actually part of a pattern of jewish kind of professional development in general like going to areas that where, where there's a real establishment that jews were basically not wanted there but there were other areas where they could develop you know develop like hollywood's like this like the scrap business, like there's, there's economic, like finance stuff. It's like there's tons and tons of areas that are kind of just a little bit adjacent where there's opportunity. Um, and they saw they saw the Ministry Department of the Interior as a place for real opportunity for the change that they wanted to see based on where they were coming from, their own family histories and all that stuff. And and they, you know, they just milked it and they wouldn't have gotten jobs, you know, at the Justice Department and they wouldn't have gotten jobs like at the Justice Department. So it was kind of these marginal ones. I make a similar argument about um that I kind of referenced about these anthropologists, um, which is in the book a little bit more, but there are areas like if you graduated from university and you wanted to be a professor um as a Jew at the turn of the last century, the thirties, forties, fifties then it was going to be really hard for you to get a job in the history department or in English or in philosophy. Uh, but you may just get a job in one of these kind of newfangled fields in sociology or in, in anthropology or in psychology or in economics, like which were brand new fields. And so it's not a surprise that if you look at the history of these sort of adjacent 
fields, like you've got a ton of Jews who are pioneers in these fields. And I thought anthropology was particularly interesting because um, uh, because the these these Jewish intellectuals like had a real political project, which is that they wanted to change the way Americans thought about race. They were really anti-race specialists, anti-racism specialists, and they created this whole field of American anthropology that we now know, I'm sure the anthropology majors, but all this talk about cultural pluralism, cultural relativism, we're all just just different from one another. We're not on a big hierarchy or anything like that. And we're not, one doesn't, culture doesn't evolve into a more complicated, better one. It's just, we're just different. These are all these anthropologists that made this, this idea put into play and established departments, wrote curricula with books. Mm -hmm. And it was serving a very Jewish purpose in a sense. Like there, if there was no race, like if race didn't explain the differences between humans, mm -hmm. something else would. And they made up the term. They, they said it's called culture. Mm -hmm. And they were explicitly trying to, you know, decenter race. Mm -hmm. right? If there's no race, then there can be no racism. And if there's no racism, there can be no anti-Semitism. Mm -hmm. And you know, the project didn't totally work, of course, but mm -hmm. but but this was like anthropology and not philosophy, you know, ministry of the interior and not, you know, not, not ministry of labor. And so there's kind of work to be done from the margins towards the inside if you're smart and do, do good work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, fascinating. Question? Yeah. Oh, thank you for this talk and this Q&A. Um, I'm, I have a, a bit of a simplistic question, and I hope you'll forgive me for it. So, but <laughs> um, so there's, um, in some ways, it seems that the story that you're telling about Jews and Native Americans can seem really parallel to the relation, Jews, American Jews' relationship to other peoples of color. And there's so much I, I teach at FF State, and I'm thinking of my colleague Mark Dellinger's work on Jews and Blacks and working together in the civil rights movement and, and the ways in which that succeeded and failed, right? So in some ways to be parallel to some yeah. of the stories you're telling. Do you, should we be coming away from this thinking about these stories as parallel or do you want us to come away thinking about the relationship between Jews, American Jews and Native Americans as, as different, as unique? I, I, that's a great question. It's not a simple question, actually, <laughs> by any stretch. I, I think that I would I would say it's probably better to think about it as a different story, because it's really not just about race. And this kind of colonialism thing is all over the place, and and it it matters, and it, and it it's like not really about race relations. So I think there are really obvious patterns to be seen, and there's it's an important kind of comparison to make. Um, but I think this broader kind of point about colonialism as, as a as a structuring process that you know moves Jews in different parts of the world that takes them out of where you know ninety percent of Jews lived for a very long time and then spread them out elsewhere, you know, around the world. Um, is a, is a real game changer in a way that's different than race relations. So blacks, you know, like the Asians and Jews thing may be interesting and similar to and probably closer to the African-American and Jews thing. And this one has some parallels, but I think it's kind of bigger, even though there's been a lot less attention to it and fewer counters numerically, but I think it's significant. Are we getting on time? Are you sure? <laughs> Oh, we're getting up. We're, we're done? Oh. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks everybody for coming. Have a good evening. Thank you all. Get warm. <laughs>